You're listening to The Philip Jordan Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome in to The Philip Jordan Show. Yes, the show is back. Of course, I am your host, Philip Jordan, from Last World College Football and 96.9 The Legend in Dothan, Alabama, where I am the in-studio host and producer for Dothan World's Football. Uh, glad to be back. Uh, took a few weeks off just to kind of recharge the batteries a little bit, uh, but now we're back full tilt. Uh, we are about to hit June, uh, and we are going to be looking ahead and preview, getting ready for football season, college football season, and any other cool sports stuff that's going to be going down. So, I mean, I know you see the logo. There's a football behind my name. Uh, moving forward, I mean, yes, we're predominantly football here, but I'm going to talk about some other sports uh, from time to time as well, from now on to as well. Uh, so, we got some uh, fun stuff coming up. Like I said, we're in June. The preseason magazines are coming out, uh, previewing teams, looking ahead to the college football season, and a bunch of good stuff going on. But on this episode, the return episode, it's kind of like a soft return in a way. Uh, this is not something we just recently recorded. I'm going to play for you guys. Uh, but a few weeks ago, uh, me and uh, Brandon Eisman, a uh, former colleague at Last Word, but he has his podcast, Talking Knowles. He covers uh, South Florida athletics too, as well. He does a bunch of different things. And uh, we uh, we tried out for a, a podcast network to talk about the Florida State Seminoles. So uh, that didn't work out, but uh, I did keep that audio. Uh, and I reworked it. I edited out saying what name of that uh, network would be. But I repurposed the audio uh, to talk about um, the Florida State Seminoles. Uh, the big part of the conversation was, is Jordan Travis a legit Heisman Trophy contender? You see that in the title of the episode. So uh, that's what we're going to do. It's probably about 25 minutes worth of content. I'm going to play for you guys, and I will close things out at the end. I remember we recorded this a few weeks ago, so you'll pick up, especially if you're following along what's happened for the state at wide receiver position lately. There's something we talked about in there that we thought was coming, but it hadn't happened yet when we recorded it. Like I said, this was a couple weeks ago when we did this, but I wanted to repurpose it and put it here on the Philip Jordan Show. So here is uh, me and Brandon Eisman talking about the Florida State Seminoles. Uh, my co-host, uh, Brandon Eisman. Brandon, uh, go Knowles, and uh, uh, how's it going? Yeah, go Knowles, Philip. It's going great, man. I'm excited to be on Locked On Seminoles, and can't wait to get started. Absolutely, of course. Uh, you can listen to Brandon on Talking Knowles and has past history writing about the Florida State Seminoles. So we talked about off the top there, a little teaser, uh, some discussions that we're going to talk about because the Florida State Seminoles – are a team uh, that is on the rise, uh, not only in the ACC, uh, along with Emma Clemson as one of the favorites, but also uh, nationally. This is a team many people believe, and I think me and you two bo uh, both believe, uh, can be a team that could win a national championship and compete for it. And uh, so it's exciting times down in Tallahassee, Brandon, because, you know, we got to go check out the spring game a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, certainly exciting times in 2023 for Florida State, coming off of a 10-win season last year in 2022. With the amount of talent that Florida State has brought back from last season and bringing in through the transfer portal and their own recruiting class, there's a lot to be excited about um, in Tallahassee. Absolutely, and a lot of the excitement uh, we we got to see has got a little bit, a little bit in the spring game. Uh, it centers around quarterback Jordan Travis, who I've been super impressed by just how he has developed over the years as a quarterback. I mean, coming from a guy, I mean, just three years ago, it was like, okay, he's just a runner. He's not a passer. And for two years in a row, he had to look over his shoulder. There was, you know, there was James Blackman. He was there. Uh, you know, then Mackenzie Milton, he was there as well. Then last season, he was the guy. I mean, just it, – it, I believe this team, obviously everybody does. It is centered around – Jordan Travis and how he plays this season, if he can continue what he did last season. Uh, but you got to look at it. Is, is he a true Heisman contender? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I certainly think so as well, Philip. And, you know, the thing with Travis is is that, yeah, he may not be 
the top quarterback in the country, but he's certainly one of the top two or three quarterbacks in the ACC going into 2023. And if you look at the way that Travis is able to lead Florida State, his throwing, especially over the top and underneath into tight spaces with receivers, is absolutely phenomenal. But his ability to scramble outside of the pocket the way that he does, the way that he reads blitzes pre-snap and is able to make the offensive line adjust and get away from defenders on the defensive line or, you know, in the middle of the field uh, with opposing linebackers that can't catch him. He doesn't have the best speed out of the quarterbacks in the country, but he certainly does have enough speed to pick up 10, 20 yards on any given carry. Yeah, absolutely. And then the thing is, when you play Florida State, and it really will put stress on the defense because, one, if you play man, okay, if somebody that is assigned to Jordan Travis loses him, uh, he's, he's going to go for a big run because what man defense does to you. So do you play a zone on him and keep more eyes on him, Will? And then maybe Florida State can attack those because they have some receivers there on the team. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and then we look at from a Heisman contender standpoint, and that's kind of like the question we're asking here. Uh, looking at, I saw on FanDuel uh, as I was getting ready for this conversation, uh, he was really just behind uh, Caleb Williams, who won the Heisman Trophy last year. You don't expect him to win it again. Uh, Bo Nix is a name that I saw that he was behind and from Oregon and Washington quarterback Michael Penix Jr., which everybody expects Washington to put a lot of points. I mean, Drake May is going to be a factor there as well. They're in the ACC. So we see that he's being talked about. And he's graded very high. I believe the highest grade of the returning players in college football at 91.7. This is per PFF, of course, coming to his sixth year. And as I mentioned, Brandon, off the top with our conversation on Jordan Travis, just I look at this. This is almost I'm going to compare this to a quarterback in the National Football League, Josh Allen. Uh, one thing that impressed me me about josh allen with the buffalo bills is the fact is that you don't see quarterbacks improve their accuracy the completion percentage usually stays around where it's at so in 2020 his first year that he really got some starting action 55 percent 2021 it went to 63 percent that's a big jump and then last year it did go to 64 percent and that's the key his accuracy has gotten better and unlike when he was first the start quarterback you just can't say okay he's a runner we'll play a certain way he is a passer, and just and what they've done and just the improvement, I keep saying it it's over and over again, but he is the catalyst for this offense. And and really, and I'll be honest, what I wasn't impressed with the backup quarterback, so I'm also kind of concerned. What if Jordan Travis gets hurt? He is a runner. I wasn't overly uh, impressed with some of the backups, what we saw back in the spring. Yeah, Philip, I, I really wasn't either, um, and that – that's a big concern, and it was kind of a concern for me last year too, especially with Tate Rodemaker and A.J. Duffy. And, look, barring any injuries or any setbacks for Jordan Travis from now until the start of the season or even during the season, he's certainly a preseason top five Heisman candidate, has to be. Um, and you spoke about hit, uh, Travis having the highest rated um, grade from – pro football focus that's exactly right in in Florida State's final six games of the year in which they went on that six game winning streak to finish 10 and 3 he had a QBR of 91.1 which is absolutely phenomenal to be able to win six games like that off of losing three conference games and have the highest rated QBR in the country at 91.1 is just certainly outstanding but the way Travis is able to force opposing defenses to crash their def- – the crashing defensive end is basically replaced by a linebacker on a read option from Travis, and Travis is just beating that linebacker off the edge. It, I, if you look at the way Jordan Travis runs the ball, and Florida State's a, a run-first offense. Guys like Trey Benson, Lawrence to a Philly, Rodney Hill coming in this year. Florida State's going to be great at running back. And, yes, they're, they're a run-first offense. But Travis can also throw the ball, and he can utilize his uh, scrambling ability as well, which makes him such a dynamic quarterback and puts him right there at the top with Caleb Williams, Drake May, Bo Nix, Michael Penix, those guys. And so when you're talking about 
Jordan Travis being a Heisman candidate and can he win the Heisman Trophy? Sure, he still has things to improve on. He's not a perfect quarterback. But if he continues to improve his accuracy, improve his reach pre-snap, and continues to get better in all aspects, running, passing, whatever the case may be, I think he can win the Heisman Trophy. Yeah, I do as well. I mean, and, and it obviously, too, we talk a lot about Jordan Travis, and you mentioned some of them, but it also depends on your parts. I mean, I think outside of Cam Newton, that's, we really don't see many quarterbacks winning the Heisman that don't have a lot of superstar talent around them. And you brought up Trey Benson running back. He is back. Now, they did lose uh, Treshawn Ward out of the transfer portal. He, went to, he goes to Kansas State. But you also brought up, you know, the other running backs uh, there on this roster as well. Then you have uh, outside, you have uh, Johnny Wilson. You said uh, Lawrence uh, Toa Philly, which he had 457 yards rushing last year as well. Uh, but Benson was a guy, too. He really came on late in the season. Uh, you know, Ward gets injured. Uh, Benson played great. In four of the last six games, he went over 100 yards. He had a three-touchdown game against Florida. And you talk about their run game, they averaged 214 rushing yards per game, which was 13th in all of college football. So while we talk about how well Jordan Travis has played as a quarterback, that run game with the running backs, I mean, I, he adds to it, but those running backs they have at Florida State takes that pressure off. And that's that's the key there to me as well. But, you know, I look at the receiver. Of course, Micah Pittman left. He's going to Utah. He transferred out, looking to replace him. Winston Wright and Ja'Kai Douglas, they kind of did some stuff in the slot during the spring. I mentioned Johnny Wilson, who uh, – here's an interesting stat on him. He had 22 catches of 20 yards or more last season, which led – the ACC. So, receiver, I want to know who's going to be that next guy that can step up because if one receiver is getting focused on and Johnny Wilson, you're going to need somebody on the other side or second receiver to step up uh, if this offense with Jordan Travis is going to excel. Yeah, you're exactly right, Philip. And I'll tell you exactly who that receiver is going to be. It's going to be the freshman Hakeem Williams. Uh, Williams was a highly touted recruit that has amazing hands. He's very quick on his feet. He can create space in the open field, get past defenders. The deep threat from Hakeem Williams is going to be something that Florida State, I think, is going to utilize a lot this year. And then on the opposite side, like you said, you've got Johnny Wilson, and then you've also got Ja'Kai Douglas and Winston Wright, but you've also got South Carolina transfer Jaheim Bell at tight end. So even though Jordan Travis is a prolific quarterback and Trey Benson – Lawrence to a Philly, Rodney Hill, those guys in the backfield. The supporting cast on the outside for Florida State that Travis has, I think can take the Seminoles quite a long way in 2023. And as we are speaking of this uh, of this recording, uh, they also are in competition with Ole Miss for transfer wide receiver from Michigan State, Keon Coleman. Uh, Red report that it is down, it seems to be Florida State and Ole Miss for his services at receiver. Uh, of course, last season with Michigan State as a redshirt freshman, 58 receptions, 798 yards, seven touchdowns. He entered the transfer portal at the same time as quarterback Peyton Thorne did, who went to Auburn. So that would be a huge pickup for Florida State if they were able to land Keon Coleman. Oh, without a doubt it would be. It, it... A wide receiver room of Johnny Wilson, Hakeem Williams, Winston Wright, Ja'Kai Douglas, and Keon Coleman would be – that that would almost be unstoppable for Florida State. I mean, how do you how do you match defenders uh, against those guys? Look, they're all, they're all really good. Obviously, Johnny Wilson is. Keon Coleman, you know, has experience at Michigan State. And I think if Florida State can land Keon Coleman, that's really big going into the season. Absolutely. So uh, we'll see. That's uh, Jordan Travis. Uh, we, we we didn't just talk about him there. We also broke down the offense a little bit. But, hey, all those parts together with him winning the Heisman, of course, wins are going to be a part of it. We'll talk about schedule a little bit later. But all those players around him winning the Heisman, winning and stuff like that, that's all part of it. That's all part of it uh, for Jordan Travis to be a Heisman contender uh, in 2023. All right, so now, you know, we talked about the quarterback. Let's talk about the coach, Mike Norvell. And I remember, Brandon, when Mike Norvell got hired to be the head coach, 
super successful there at Memphis. I really liked the hire. Now, year one wasn't good. They went three and six. But I'll also say this. That was 2020. That's a really tough ask for any head coach to come in without a spring, without getting to know your players through that way. And just the the limitations the COVID year put on as head coach. They went three and six. And then the next year they go five and seven. They had a strong end to the season. They started 0 and 4. We remember the Notre Dame game. They played better, but lost a close game to Florida. They couldn't get bowl eligible. But you kind of saw some positive things there in that second half of the 2021 season. Of course, 10 and 3. Going five and three in ACC last season. You know, I had those three tough losses middle of the year: Wake Forest, NC State, and Clemson. But outside of that, like we mentioned earlier in the show, six straight wins to end the season. Uh, I'm going I'm to let you lead this off, and then I'll give my thoughts. What What do you think, other than patience? Because most schools are not patient like this with a coach, but Florida State has been. But what do you think? What What do you think uh, has been the reason why Florida State? has been able to turn this around with Mike Norvell. Yeah, obviously, Philip. you know, you talked about patience, and obviously that's a big key factor um, when any school hires a new coach. I mean, obviously you got to be patient. But, look, going three and six in 2020 when Norvell was hired and then going five and seven in 21 and then jumping, improving dramatically going 10 and three last year, you know, I, I think it comes down to Norvell really – being able to speak to the players, get them to buy in, and bring in solid coordinators like Alex Atkins and Adam Fuller, um, and then you know all the other coaches that he's brought in. I, I think getting the players to buy in really was the first, um, the first factor of getting this team to where they want to be and where they should be, not only in the ACC but with the likes of you know, the big time programs in college football, once again, to where Florida State used to be. And obviously, you know, you're going to lose players to the transfer portal, but the guys that you've kept have really, you can see it in practice. You see it on the field. They're buying into what Norvell is doing culturally at Florida State. And so I think it's really a culture shift and Norvell is taking the right approach to changing the culture in Tallahassee, getting the players to buy in, and then you're seeing the results on the field. Yeah, I agree with you on that completely. And you talk about the culture, and that's going to lean into why. One of the big things I think has been a big – it's not the only thing, but a big key part of turnaround for the state. But I will say this, you're talking about bringing players back. 90% of their production from last season is back. I mean, how many college football teams that are good are going to say that? I mean, there's probably plenty of bad teams because they didn't – have good players and they didn't leave. They, they're staying with the school, but offense a lot. That's been the thing for me because Brandon, it, it's been a long time. It, this dates back to Jimbo Fisher years. Uh, offense line play been horrible. I was still, I still remember DeAndre Francois just getting destroyed. I mean, he never had time as a quarterback, and Florida State had struggled with that, struggled with that, and struggled with that. And last season was really the first year, and we really saw it really take a major jump up when it comes to line play, especially protecting the quarterback. Uh, on average, they only gave up 1.54 sacks per game, so that's one and a half sacks. Um, and then, of course, Jordan Travis probably takes care of some of that with his scramble ability. That's huge. And they returned guys from last year's offense line, uh, Dimitri Emanuel, Mort Smith, and then you also have uh, Robert Scott Jr. returning the interior of the offensive line. You bring in Casey Roderick from Colorado, uh, Keandre Jones from Auburn, Jeremiah Briars from UTEP. You got some more depth. They got 17 scholarship offensive linemen, and, and that's where it starts for me. That's why the running game is so good. That's why Jordan Travis has gotten better. Fixing that offensive line has really changed things with Florida State, in my opinion, because now we're not seeing the quarterback being – you know, beat up. They win first down. They're not in second long and third long like they were before. And I'm always a firm believer. It all starts at the offensive line, and and that's where I, that's one of the main improvements and main reasons for me why I've seen this turnaround. It's just because the offensive line has gotten so much better. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that, Philip. And if Florida State's offensive line wasn't as good as it is right now. Jordan Travis would not have had the year he had last year. The program wouldn't have won 10 games. The The running backs wouldn't be able to rush for as many yards and touchdowns as they are. And we wouldn't be talking about Jordan Travis being a Heisman, 
Heisman contender or Florida State being a potential college football playoff team in 2023 uh, or 2024, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the amount of leadership and depth that this offensive line has for Florida State I think is going to take them a long way, not only in 2023, but in the next three to four years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Coach Atkins has done a fantastic job uh, building that offensive line, what they've done there under Mike Norvell. All right, we're going to take our last break of the show, but when we return, we'll take a look at the Florida State 2023 schedule. It's a quite interesting one early on, but uh, we'll look at that. And lastly, to close up, we are going to talk about the schedule. And uh, obviously, Brandon, we can't go any further with the schedule without talking about that first game against LSU. Uh, Florida State won this game 24-23 last year. LSU had some issues uh, in special teams, extra points all over the place. Uh, but Florida State got that first victory. Uh, we were talking all fair. We both believe this should be a top 10 matchup. I think I'm, I'm high on LSU over an SEC. I think LSU should be the favorites for the SEC West. That's a team that's looking to take that next step to get into the playoff after a successful 10 win season last year. Florida State's looking like a team that wants to win the ACC, get the ACC title game be a playoff contender as well. So, man, th this game is big, big for both of these schools opening up, but particularly for Florida State, trying to beat LSU two years in a row because they're going to be looking – LSU's going to be looking to get some revenge on the Knowles, but I, how Florida State combats with that is going to be interesting. I, I'm really I'm really excited uh, for this opening game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am too. Labor Day weekend, it's on a Sunday night in prime time on ABC in Florida State's backyard in Orlando. Um it does. It, it's not going to get any better than that for Florida State football to open the season. Uh, like you said, Philip, Florida State won 24-23 last year. That was a really, really good game last year. I, you know, going into that, I wasn't really sure how LSU was going to play against Florida State. But look, both teams played well. Both teams won ten games last year. Um, both teams are definitely on the rise again in their respective conferences, and. I saw an interview with Florida State Athletic Director Michael Alford from this past week that said, and he said that he wants Orlando to be fielding Garnet and Gold. I mean, it's only a couple hours from Tallahassee. It's, the Camping World Stadium should be filled with Florida State fans. It should be like 80 20 in percentage of, of fans. It'll probably be 50 50, but it should be 80 20 because that's FSU's backyard, basically. Um, and ironically, Philip, both both teams ended their season playing in Orlando, and they're going to open in Orlando against each other. Um, so, look, obviously, you can't talk about Florida State schedule without talking about the LSU game. That should, and I think it will be, a top ten matchup, if not a top fifteen matchup, depending on you know preseason AP poll rankings. But that's a pivotal game for both teams, um, and I'm excited to see the Noles play again. I can't wait. Yeah, and actually, I was look. I looked it up early, very early. Uh, LSU was listed as a one point favorite. So that's pretty much saying you, they think it's even. And then if you add in that home crowd that Florida State have there in Orlando, uh, that will be a, a could be a big determining factor in that one. Yeah, I, I, on another podcast, I do. I was talking to a guy that covers Florida State. I said they really should call it the the Cheez It Football Classic or something, since both these teams uh, won bowl games with Cheez It. Uh, in their name, but uh, he said he hasn't heard anything on that response. But hey, if any, you know, Cheez It needs to get Cheez It jump on that. Uh, but moving past that, they will play Southern Miss the following week and at Boston College. But then on the 23rd of September, they're at Clemson. So, and I look at Florida State's schedule, the month of September is huge. Um, I honestly, at worst case, and this would not be good, and Florida State fans, everybody would be. Uh, upset and distraught and think, okay, where's our season going? Two and two. If you lose to LSU and Clemson, but if you beat them, you're four and zero, oh, and that really catapults you throughout the rest of the season. But that will be at Clemson, at the other uh, Death Valley. Uh, that we're, this is a Florida State show. We're not going to get into that discussion on which Death Valley is which. Uh, which one is better? But man, you go to Clemson and look. What's that team going to look like? Uh, new offensive coordinator Garrett Riley. Uh, DJ's not there anymore. Okay, Clubnett's going to be the guy at quarterback. 
So, I mean, that's a big game. And look, this may not be the first time these two, te- only time these two teams play either because ACC doesn't have divisions anymore. So, this could be also a preview to the ACC championship game uh, in December. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the ACC scrapping divisions is going to make things very interesting uh, starting in 2023, this upcoming season. Uh, and, Philip, you know, you talked about obviously playing LSU in Orlando and then getting Southern Miss at home and then traveling to Chestnut Hill to play Boston College. And then the next week you're on the road at Clemson as well. Um, look, Florida State could either go 4-0 or 2-2, and and maybe 3-1 and in one of those. But if you were to ask me right now which game matters more for Florida State throughout the entire schedule, I think it's the LSU game. You start off with that game, you win that game, you're in a really good position, you're still a top-10 team. And then you get an easy game with Southern Miss, and then you start ACC play. And then, obviously, going to Clemson on September 23rd is going to be tough and brutal. It always is going to, you know, Death Valley up there in Clemson. Um, what are the chances Florida State has two Saturday night ABC primetime games in the month of September, LSU and Clemson? I like the odds there. Um, but, yeah, starting ACC play against Boston College and Clemson is obviously going to be tough. Um and the schedule only gets tougher start in October. So, um, really, it doesn't start off easy, and it's not end easy either. Yeah, I, I guess I kind of – I'm on the opposite side on the importance. I think the Clemson game is more important just because of ACC standpoint. You lose to LSU, that's close, but if you can run the rest of the way through the ACC, you're, I think you're good, especially depending on what L, if LSU does what I think they can do this season but you know i you can make an argument either way i mean both games are going to be big you know I, and then what's going to be big about that too after clemson you're off you get your off week and you say wow you want your off week week five look after you've done but went through lsu first and then back-to-back road acc games at boston college at clemson i think it's a good maybe a good time for an off week then you play virginia tech syracuse okay you should beat those teams duke is going to be interesting i've taught some people to cover acc that's a team that they feel could be a dark horse team, maybe a team that Florida State may look past, especially if they're undefeated. Uh, they'll be at Wake Forest. We don't know what that team's going to look like without Sam Hartman. How good will they be? Pitt's a tricky one. At Pitt on November 4th because Pitt's a well-coached team. They've got a solid roster. I think that's one late in the year they should look out for because uh, – they got Miami at home. You play North Alabama, and you know I'm not high on the Florida Gators. So that that pit game in November, I look at the schedule. That intrigues me. That 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 is an interesting uh, uh place to go play. That's a good team. Usually, good coach team. They play hard. So that that's going. I think that's one that Florida State fans should keep an eye on. Yeah, I certainly agree, and I I, I think the Duke game is as well. Um, look, going into this season, I think Duke is going to be a sleeper team in the conference. I don't think anybody should overlook Duke this year. Um, But going to Pitt towards the end of the year could be a trap game, honestly. Um, They have, like you said, Phil, they've got a really good roster, which we know Florida State does too. But if Florida State gets ahead of themselves, they could go into Pitt and lose that game. And that, you know, potentially could cost them a chance at an ACC title, depending on what happens, you know, in the games prior to that. Um, Pitt, I think, is probably the most, um, the best example of a trap game this year for Florida State, along with Duke. But I think Pitt more just because it's on the road. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be interesting because once you get past Clemson, look, this is college football. Sometimes teams look past people, if especially like we say. You get past LSU, you get past Clemson, you're four and zero. Then attention is going to be on you because now you're you're looked at. If you're top ten team, you're really up there at the top of the rankings. Then if you can knock off those two teams early in the season. All right, guys, what do you guys think? Uh, did you enjoy uh, me and Brandon breaking down the Seminoles? Hope you did. If you're on YouTube right now, leave a comment below and let us know what you think. Uh, if you're on Apple Podcast, checking out the show, please uh, go to the review section. Uh, leave a review and uh, give me your thoughts there. And you can email me at sportsdollphilipjordan at gmail.com. And remember to check out Brandon's podcast, Talking Knowles. And you can follow Brandon on Twitter at Heisman Eisman. So uh, go give him a follow, give him a subscribe. 
uh, with the podcast. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Philip Jordan Show. I'm planning on doing another one on Thursday. SEC spring meetings are this week. So I thought about talking about that a little bit today. But I said, no, there's not much coming out. I mean, I, I basically will be previewing it. So I think Thursday will be a good day to hop back on here and talk about whatever is said. Uh, and it comes out of SEC spring meetings. Of course, so I think probably one of the bigger conversation pieces will be the nine-game SEC schedule. But anyways, any good stuff comes out, I will talk about it on Thursday's show. Now, anybody checking out on YouTube, as you can tell, you're just seeing the audio. Um, I'm pretty much... And I hope, and if, if you really love seeing my face all the time, seeing my guests have conversations, that's not completely going away, but I am going to be just doing strictly or mostly doing audio only podcasts for the time being going forward. And, and there's a big reason for that. And look, pull back the current a little bit. I do work a full time job, an eight to five. And then so doing this, prepping, getting ready, just all the stuff I had to do on the videos, getting go find pictures or graphics to throw up on the screen, preparing those, all that good stuff. It takes a lot of time with the video side of things. And look, um, I'm human. Uh, I get tired. Uh, I get worn down. And I just wanted to continue to do this. And that's what I've been thinking about since I've been on hiatus for the last few weeks. How can I, I want to keep doing this, but how can I kind of, give myself more time for other things. And that's how I'm not going to do video as much. I'm, I will still do video interviews. And if I do do a video interview with somebody, I will post that up on the YouTube channel, but it, just the full show, all the other stuff. Nah, I'm, I'm just not doing full on video like that anymore. So it's pretty much a audio podcast, but some of my guests we do do over video. So I will still, I will still post those videos on YouTube. But um, the whole solo stuff I do on video with graphics and all that stuff, I'm just not really just going to scale that back a little bit, give myself more time. And when I do that, there'll be more energy. And I think I could put out a better product just going audio like this moving forward. So that, that's kind of what you want you to expect. So Thursday, when I post a podcast, it's just going to be me, my audio, talking about SEC spring meetings. There should be a spring football report. Uh, this week, I'm going to get back to doing that show as well. Same deal there. It would just be an audio pod. And then the Wiregrass High School Football Ports returning very, very soon. And that will be another situation where audio only. So scaling back a little bit, not doing the video stuff as much, but I think the show, the audio format will be really, really good. I think it'll be better because I'm just focusing on that and it give me one more time to get to bed earlier at night. And uh, I think have more energy uh, to bring it to you guys whenever. I post a podcast. We always remember you can follow me on social media at P Jordan SEC. The podcast is available on all your favorite podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please follow, rate, and review. Leave a review. I will read it on a future edition of the show. Of course, as I just said, you check the show out over on YouTube at the Philip Jordan Media YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell for all the notifications, and please leave a comment on the video and I'll read it on a future edition of the show you can always email me at sports at jordan at gmail.com and check out all my written work over at last word on college football everybody has a great tuesday i'll talk to you guys later in the week when we look back and what was said this week with sec spring meetings till next time bye-bye